um, this is a big subject, um, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. So we're going to be sort of, you know, just flying over the top here. This is a, uh, a such a big subject, and there's so many deep subjects that have so much technical information. It's really difficult to address everything. So we're just going to be skipping across the top with all of this. Um, I've been in the business for over 18 years. Um, I left my original business, which is actually the film industry, uh, to do something that I felt was um, going to be something for the future. Uh, I was wanting to remain uh, at home with my family rather than travel around the world doing films. Uh, now look at me, I'm traveling the world. So uh, anyhow, I want to see something come of it. But basically terminology, and, and I think this is one of the things in the farm bill that everybody gets wrong. Look, the whole species is cannabis sativa L. That's what it is taxonomically. That's what it is legally. The definitions of it, are, the, the, that's the problem. The definitions aren't even in the UN Singles Convention on Drugs. The only thing they do is exclude the use of cannabis for industrial applications. End of story. Um, and the rest you make up as a sovereign nation, what you call it. So that, that's where the issue starts. Now, the UN uh, in uh, 2016 is going to readdress this problem because now we have DNA fingerprinting. We can actually determine what cannabis is what now and def make better definitions. So that's where it's going. But the interesting thing here is that a lot of people don't know this. Over, there's over 2,000, uh, let's say, types. It's a, it's a really broad description. And, and the original types, types I'll say. And 90% of those are non-drug. So cannabis in reality is, is a non-drug non plant um, or psychotropic plant to be more accurate. Um, it's, it's roughly about 10%. And of course, when legislation came in in the different countries about drugs, uh, everybody went underground with those 10% uh, and now they've got so many varieties that it's just unbelievable. So in reality, cannabis uh, in its natural state, 90% uh, of it's non-drug. Um, <clears throat> cannabis grown all over the place. Um, I might be concentrating on that, but uh, what I want to concentrate on is um, where the best places in the world historically have been to grow industrial hemp. One of them is that Ukraine steppes, Russian sort of area. Fantastic area. Kept the English Navy and England going for years on the sea, and that was where they got all their hemp from in reality. And it just grows beautifully there. Magnificent country. A um, bit difficult to work in. The other place is, uh, well, that's what it looks like in UK and Ukraine, Russia. At the present, they're still pretty, well, they've got some other machines that do it, but it's pretty archaic, the, the, the systems. The other place is in China, <clears throat> particularly up north of Harbin. They, they've been doing it for a long, long time there too. And um, uh, uh, they still do grow, you know, it's, it's, it's lots of places in China that I've visited and they basically grow it all over China. But they don't sort of coordinate between each other uh, at all. Uh, but Harbin, or north of Harbin, up in that, that area there, um, has a lot. Now that's just one, I couldn't photograph it, but they just grow mountains of this stuff and they stack it all up over winter, then it's in about 10 metres of snow until summer comes and then they, that's the part of their retting process, but it's, it's just mountains of it. Um, it grows well there too, but they've got real transport link problems. You know, I sat in a car for eight hours uh, driving at an unbelievable speed for Chinese roads at about 120 kilometres an hour before I got to the main hemp area. And then they had all these redding ponds, a really filthy way of doing it, but you know, it, it, anyhow, there's a lot going on there too. Um, and the other great place in the world to grow hemp historically was this region, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, North Carolina, so forth and so on. And that's because of its natural environment, because of the soil type, because of the rainfall, because of a whole lot of things. But there's something different about what was grown here a long time ago and what happens now. And that's what well, we've got to change back because this crop is best suited for this area. This is one of the greatest places on earth to grow this crop. So if you can't get it going here, it isn't going to happen anywhere. So this is really... A, a, a major uh, step forward for the industry globally and what you guys are able to bring together here and achieve here is going to set the template for the global environment, for uh, green materials, for all sorts of applications for the future. 
So there's a little bit of other than your own pocket involved in this. Um, the interesting thing though is, is that you lie below 40 degrees latitude. And hemp is a, is a short day plant. So the varieties that are traditionally grown in the more um, agricultural areas such as Europe and uh, even down <coughs> Turkey and all those sort of places, the varieties don't necessarily work as well here. And it's to do with yield rather than, they'll grow, they'll grow anywhere. But they don't grow very well if they're not in their suitable environment. And when you look at that latitude, Australia plays a very interesting role in that because we're smack bang in the same sort of area as here. We speak roughly the same language. We <laughs> use the same decimal currency type concept of the dollar. Uh, we have a, a democratic society where you vote and hopefully get what you've voted for um, and, and things like that, you know. Um, and, uh, geographically, we have a very big spread. We, in fact, have a bigger spread than the US in the sense of latitude. And being a short day plant, we've got a significant advantage <coughs> because we can actually trial varieties right up and down from a sort of like you know, 15 degrees latitude right down to 42 or 43 if we need to. And it's a very important factor when you come to learning about how to grow it and where to grow it and what varieties will work. So is all this making sense? Anybody yeah. right? following the trend? Um, to, to illustrate that very quickly, this is in France in 2007, I sent the FNPC some of our cultivars. Um, I can't, I wasn't there because the Rugby World Cup was on, if anybody knows what that is. Um, and so I couldn't spend a lot of time. Um, but this is uh, 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 F77, I think, or 75, Futura, uh, Futura 75. And it had already, it's one of their uh, fiber-ish varieties. Um, very difficult to harvest for seed. But anyway, another story. Um, uh, and that is gone at two seed and set seed. And you might be able to see this is a male that was getting up to about there. This is our variety from uh, tropical, subtropical areas, growing in uh, at about 46 degrees latitude. Um, and it's still growing. It's having a party. It's never had that many daylight hours in its life, for instance in its recent genetic history. And so therefore it was growing and grew on for another month and huge yield. So just want you to understand the genetic drift or the genetic, the way these things work, you can take stuff from the tropics and move it north in this sense, but it's very hard to pull it down. So just get that in your head, guys. Just keep that there. Not always, you can change, you know, for example, you could probably take a fiber variety that's sort of 47 degrees latitude and you might be able to move it down to 37, 38 and make it into a seed variety. You might. It's all about the shape and form of the harvesting. Talking North America or something? I'm talking North America here. I'll, okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, moving on. This is the crux of what you're all going to face, guys, and we've been facing it for many years, is the value chain. Now, without seed, you've got nothing. Um, so uh, I want you to all understand that, that, that there's ways around going through the same pains we went through. And it, it's about closer collaboration and it's about sharing, which I know is sometimes hard when everybody thinks I've got a piece of IP and all that sort of stuff. But realistically, this is where University of Kentucky comes in or any of the research institutes. Collectively, if everybody took all the money they're going to do trials in this room this year, and gave it to UK, they would get a better result than what they're going to do themselves. That's my opinion. So, I think. I didn't pay Bill to say that. No, you didn't, but I'm just recommending it. <laughs> David from UK. Um, but seed supply is the big issue. Um, what happened to us was, of course, when we introduced legislation in Australia, or certainly in Queensland and Tasmania, New South Wales later, Western Australia, blah, 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 blah. We sat down around a table and we talked for two to three years with the government, trying to explain to them from a professional agricultural breeding perspective what was important. Now, the question about 0.3% that someone brought up here, look, it, it's, you know, this is my story. It, it is as accurate as I can tell you. But there's some very good cultivars in Hungary and Yugoslavia and all these other places. They're all about 05 
Uh, just so happens that one of the biggest producers of seed in, 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 in Europe is uh, the FNPC. And when Europe sort of changed their legislation, they went to the biggest producer and they said, hey, what should we regulate for? And they said, oh, 0 0.3. That cut out everybody else. And I said, so 0 0.3 has got nothing to do with science or psychotropic capacity or anything like that. So when we sat down with our legislators, we said, let's get real here. What is reasonable? And since that time, we've got legislation for 0.5% for propagation of all seed. In other words, you can repropagate because of the potential for drift. And up to 1% as a tolerance, but you can't repropagate that seed, but any crop that's up to 1%, no problem. Um, and that has now spread throughout Australia. Uh, Tasmania is about to pick it up. I got that legislation put into the Uruguay legislation. And so therefore that, that ball is rolling. And I think it's reasonable because Anybody going down to the bar or the pub or wherever they sell marijuana or whatever it is and, and hand someone a 1.1% a, a, a uh, bag of dope is not going to get good business, I can tell you right now. <laughs> and it's all about the enforcement and it's about the practical reality of what is a drug crop and what isn't. But anyway, the, your legislators and your people need to understand there are other ways of looking at this and I'm happy to provide that information. After you got some seed, then you're going to seek growers. Now, growers need time to learn. You know, no grower is going to take a new crop they've never grown before, go out there and, and be perfect in the first year or the second year. It usually takes about three years before you get it right. The wonderful thing about growers is that they, they fail the first time. They usually want to succeed the second time. I'll even try harder the second time. I'll learn from their mistakes. And that's really important. Because once you get a base of growers, you can create scale. And with scale, then you can go to industry and you can sell products because they know that they're going to get a supply. Nobody's going to change from what they're presently using to a, a dribble of, of possibly some hemp coming in uh, sometime. They want to know that it's there in store and that they can start making their muesli bars or making their cars with a constant supply. So scale is important. What you need, what the, the industries that do exist, of course, is the, the grain harvesting, the, 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 the fibre harvesting or the production, and the uh, uh, specialist ones like flour production, CBD, whatever. So they're basic three, three uh, directions. From there, grain, well, we all know there's plenty of opportunity for grain. Most of the infrastructure within industry exists, whether it's cleaning, dehulling, pressing, whatever, and, and, and businesses out there can press some other oil and you can put some you can put some hemp through as well, adjust a few things, know what you're doing and away you go. That's a line of industry that exists now. Um, the next one, much harder, because a lot of this infrastructure doesn't exist and the markets that you need to get into are of even greater scale requirement. Um, the refinement to get into the higher end value added area is another step forward. So that doesn't exist. Um, and within the, uh, the uh, CBD or, or, or cannabinoid area of things, you know, even the uh, extraction processes and all that sort of stuff are expensive and so forth and so on. So you've got an area here that is really needs a lot of uh, uh, work before it becomes viable and before it can be consistent to, to industry. Now, verti vertically integrated uh, uh, businesses that reach back into these areas and support those manufacturing and uh, or, or uh, uh, value adding uh, uh, things are going to do a lot better. So buddy up with someone who's got a market, but the guys who've got the market better buddy up properly with their suppliers rather than seeing them as uh, easy pickings. The other area that's a real issue is your genetics. And, um, you know, well, it is what it is. You'll work it out. Um, so I'm going to finish with this slide because other people are going to come on and I'm going to say what we did. What we had to do, and I call this the, the industry shelf, because basically take any one of those books out or either bookend and you've got nothing. And we start off with the legislation. If you don't get that right, you, you, you're limiting what your seed stock is. We're lucky. We, we pass legislation where we have access to all forms of cannabis. doesn't matter what it is, where it comes from, what drug level it is or whatever. We have a large genetic seed bank. You'll hear about that later. And we're able to take characteristics from the different varieties that are out there, combine them to create an industrial hemp variety that suits 
whatever region, whatever it is. So that is something you guys should be thinking about as well uh, in your legislation. But that brings forth a, a, a seed stock. And that seed stock is, is going to what make it viable to grow hemp instead of corn or whatever else is out there. You know, you've got to give your farmers, your growers, an opportunity to make more money out of the hemp than they would be out of something else. Otherwise, why are they going to do it? So yield, 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 yield. Um, but then you've got to create a seed supply. It takes an average of about seven years from the inception of a new variety to the way you're going to go out there and buy it in bulk. So be patient, pool your resources, get behind UK. Um, the next thing is the agronomy. I mean, everywhere has different agronomy. So that's all got to be worked out. Whoever said hemp doesn't need pesticides or insecticides or whatever it is and taken up that gauntlet is wrong. I can tell you here and now, if you're going to save a crop from being destroyed by Heliothus, you got two alternatives. Go broke or spray. It's as simple as that. If you do not get your crop in properly and the weeds come through and start to beat it while it's still infant, plant something else or spray. Broadly, or, 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 or grasses, whatever it is. Or really be smart and prepare it properly and get it going and all that sort of stuff. You, you can do it organically and you can get away without those pesticides. But it does happen, guys. It's not, it's not bulletproof. Um, so the agronomy, the use of chemicals, uh, having them on listed on your, uh, you know, they've got, they've got to be listed. You can't use them unless you get some minimum use permit type sort of thing. All that stuff has to happen. Um, your product handling. This is a bulky product. This isn't something you can just sort of throw in the back of the car and expect that, you know, you can take it down there and someone's going to process it and it's going to be worth money. You really have to look at the volume of material it has to get from A to B to be processed before it comes worth something more. And, and, and so the handling is really important of it. Um, the book of processing. Well, it doesn't matter what you're processing. You're going to do something with it, with seed, fibre or cannabinoids. Techniques. The interesting thing about this one was everything I saw everywhere else in the world, whether it was China or, or, or Russia or in, particularly in Europe, is following an old road with more horsepower. That doesn't get you anything. You need a new freeway here for this business. You can't work on old systems and just beef them up with horsepower and think they're efficient. Crazy things are going on in Europe, and that's why Europe has never really got further than where it is today, which is basically stagnating, because they haven't been innovative in their approach. Well, most of them haven't been. Value adding technologies, Product uh, development. There's a guy here I was talking to earlier about product development. You need those guys. That's market pull. You need them as well because you will not, you know, you flood the market with uh, horse bedding after five minutes of production. Then where are you going to go? Um, and uh, the, the, the dynamic markets, the really big end ones, which I'll talk about later on in my last presentation. So this is bookended between the DNA. The, 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 this is what we're doing. We're taking DNA. And it's, it's got a code, and it converts soil, water, air, whatever, into this wonderful product that has unique properties that need to be exploited, and that is going to be exploited by the material science, which is going to convert these materials into something very special on a number of levels that will actually affect our whole lives, positively. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Tim. Tim now, and he'll get on with his business. Good morning. Good morning. Um, all right, um, I'm part of Vico Fibre's plant science program. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about uh, varietal development and opportunities for the different end uses um, centred around germplasm development um, and share with you some of our experience from Australia. Um, I'm also, as part from being with Vico Fibre Industries, I'm also a PhD candidate at Southern Cross Uni. Um, with a thesis, domestication and adaptation of cannabis sativa germplasm. Um, most of this you'll already know, it's one of the oldest domesticated species on the planet, extensively cultivated around the world, um, dispersed throughout Europe three and a half thousand years ago, and the centre of diversity is in Central Asia, um, not Europe where the bulk of production and varietal development has been. 
um, Phil's already shown you that um, <clears throat> multi-use crop yields up to 18 tonnes per hectare of dry matter, um, up to three tonnes per hectare of high value grain. Um, this is primarily with undeveloped varieties. So there's a huge amount of potential for increasing yields um, over time with varietal development. Medicinal compounds as well. Um, it's essentially in its infancy. Um, it's been highly developed for THC, uh, but there's numerous other cannabinoids as well, which <clears throat> over the next probably five to 10 years will come online other than CBD. <clears throat> um, and the plant matures at anywhere from... Yeah, the yields begin, could you do the yields again? Um, of, in terms of biomass, um, which is herd and fibre, 18 tonnes per hectare uh, dry matter. Um, we've achieved that in Australia. Um, up to three tonnes per hectare of grain um, has been achieved with the current varieties. The Vavilov Institute used to have about 2,000 accessions. Um, <clears throat> because of it hasn't been repropagated, um, they're now down to about 450 accessions. And the last time they were repropagated was in 1995. Um, so the genetic resources are dwindling, um, essentially. Uh, the former CPRO collection has 200 accessions, most of which are actually in the Vavilov's collection. Um, again, there's very few originating from subtropical latitudes, which are essentially what's relevant to Kentucky and Australia. Um, our ecofibre collection, we've got 243 varieties. Um, we're now up to over a thousand accessions generated from those 243 varieties. And in fact, we've actually now got over 65 varieties originating from the subtropics, uh, which we use for the breeding program. Uh, there's also several small privately owned collections, uh, which are not available essentially for people to breed or develop with. Um, <clears throat> if you look there, you'll see we've got a, probably the broadest germplasm collection in the world, um, primarily because of the subtropical genetics we have access to. Uh, <clears throat> recently we did a collection trip in Bhutan, which is about 27 degrees of latitude. Um, in fact, we have more than 25 varieties out of there now. We've just received another shipment from them. Um, 38 varieties from China. Um, and you're probably familiar with the old Kentucky hemp varieties were primarily Chinese genetics um, uh, crossed with some European genetics as well. So the basis for our plant breeding program is improving the subtropical genetics, which essentially have been unselected for their land race collections. Um, they have a high level of variability. The original populations are not particularly uniform. Um, so there's quite a lot of work needs to be done in, in terms of developing those varieties for different end uses <coughs> and for different locations, latitudes, etc. Um, but as you can see, we have a very extensive germplasm collection, which we're working from. Um, grain and food varieties. There's a, a, a photo of a grain crop uh, we grew in Australia. Um, we're getting over a tonne uh, per hectare of grain um, from a, this is a straight subtropical variety. Um, in terms of Comparisons with European varieties, uh, similar yields at this stage. Uh, there's quite a lot of work to be done in terms of getting average yields up. We I have achieved figures as high as six tonnes per hectare in experimental plots, um, but they're essentially new varieties that aren't at a commercial level yet. So there's a lot of opportunity for increasing grain yields for both production seed and for food seed. Uh, medicinal varieties, uh, this is just an example of a medicinal variety we've developed that has significant levels of CBD in it um, while it maintains that THC content of less than 0.3%. Again, we've also identified numerous varieties within the germplasm collection that are relatively high in other cannabinoids as well. Now, most of the interest at the moment is in CBD, but as I said before, over the coming decade, there's going to be a lot of interest and focus on some of the other cannabinoids as well that have very specific medicinal actions and uses. Um, fibre and biomass. Um, 
This is a five metre high subtropical variety. Um, if you look in the, the trials of the <coughs> European varieties, because they're adapted to the higher latitudes, um, you have to hold off planting, otherwise they'll flower straight away. We can plant subtropical varieties in Australia and here much earlier than you can European varieties. And again, you harvest them much later than the European varieties. So this crop hasn't set seed yet um, and it's at five metres tall. Um, significant opportunities and these varieties, we're significantly down the road of developing them. But again, there's still a lot more potential for increasing um, yields and specific traits, grain yield attached to fibre varieties and things like that. Where I'm based at Southern Cross Uni, we've developed specific facilities um, that allow us to repropagate um, and characterise multiple varieties at the same time. The plant obviously cross-pollinates, it's wind-pollinated, so you can't regenerate seed side by side. It's actually quite difficult um, in the context of having a lot of varieties. It is very difficult to repropagate them and keep the lines pure at the same time that you're trying to run breeding and development programs. Um, so we've got a system of pollen proof chambers. Um, it's all controlled environment, HID lighting, um, variable temperature, it's fully automatic nutrient um, watering systems. The different varieties vary between six weeks seed to seed up to about 16 weeks seed to seed. Um, and we can get through 80 to 100 accessions a year if that system is running flat out. Um, as far as we know, this is quite a unique system in the context of being used for germplasm maintenance um, within the world. Uh, the SCU Ecofiber Project, um, varieties are grown for seed propagation, <coughs> characterisation. Um, so at the same time, we're keeping them alive, keeping the varieties alive. We also collect data on cannabinoid profile, seed composition, uh, morphology, um, <coughs> flowering dates for multiple latitudes in Australia. We have licences that allow us to grow all of the material in secure premises. Um, in we can only take out varieties that meet regulatory requirements to do field trials with them. So once we've worked out uh, which ones meet those requirements, we then take them to multiple latitudes and see how they behave at different latitudes. And this is basically the platform that we build the breeding program off. Um, here's an example uh, of some of the morphological differences uh, in different varieties. Um, you'll see over here, these are European varieties, um, significantly smaller leaves. Uh, these are anywhere up to 40 centimetre long leaflets. These are massive leaves. Um, and that goes through, we have varieties with 40, 50 centimetre long internodes, um, where your European varieties are, are sitting at the, the 20 centimetre internode. So that's part of the genetic reason why the subtropical varieties get much taller um, and much higher biomass yields. Um, uh, more examples of the variation that we get to use to, to breed from. Uh, very, very loose open heads to dense heads, uh, highly branched plants, straight plants, and this is from the same gene pool from the same variety. Um, so obviously there's quite a lot of work needs to be done within all of these land race varieties to generate uniform populations for agricultural production. Um, but the variations there, um, fibre varieties, typically you want to be straight, single stemmed varieties, seed varieties, you can use higher densities of, of a straight plant or you can use uh, specifically very, very branched plants um, for seed production. And in the context of, of things like seed weights, uh, we have Chinese varieties which are 10,000 seed per kilo. Um, and from the Bhutan collection, uh, we have seed weights in the order of 350,000 
feed per kilo. So again, it's John just trying to demonstrate the variability that exists that we've got for the future development of hemp varieties for the different purposes. Uh, in the replicated trials, uh, we've done at Southern Cross. Um, this is just an example of, of some of the levels of variation we've seen. Um, if you look for, say, at internodal length, um, varieties that have been selected for fibre varieties in land race populations, so village um, hemp culture, you'll find that there's very, very small levels of variation um, on those for varieties that have been selected as a grain crop, for instance, there's very large levels of, of variation in those lines. Um, again, looking at fibre percentages um, up to in the order of, of 20 to 30 percent fibre. Uh, this is a fibre variety here, uh, very consistent in its performance, but that variety might be very, very variable uh, for some of the other characteristics it's got. Um, so again, this process of varietal development is a lengthy process. As Phil says, it, it could be anywhere from five to ten years to properly develop a variety, get it uniform, and then get it into production levels of seed where you can grow large areas of it. Um, analytical methods we use, um, particularly for cannabinoid analysis, uh, various instrumentation um, that we use, seed nutritional compositions. Again, uh, it's another part, it's a large part of my PhD is actually looking at seed composition. Um, <clears throat> and we have a, the full range of analytical equipment at Southern Cross that allows us not only to characterise but to use this equipment for the purposes of breeding and development, um, as well as morphological observations in terms of internodal length, plant heights, um, all that sort of thing. Um, recent germplasm acquisitions, because again, the whole germplasm and germplasm acquisition underpins the development of all new varieties and into the future. Um, these sort of uh, wild and land race populations are going to be instrumental in creating varieties for different end uses and different purposes and for different latitudes, um, because obviously, as we've already said, uh, latitude plays and location plays a large part in how these plants express themselves. They behave quite differently at different latitudes and, and different areas. Um, <clears throat> so we've got now 40 varieties out of Bhutan. Where Bhutan sits in the Himalayas is right in the centre of um, where hemp comes from. Um, and these are populations that essentially aren't utilised by humans at the moment. So we're hoping to find quite large amounts of genetic variation in there, which we can then incorporate into established varieties um, for new purposes and uses and locations. Um, we've recently got varieties, out, extra varieties out of China as well uh, that have specific end uses for food and fibre. Uh, <clears throat> this is an example uh, of hemp in Bhutan. Um, you can see it there. Uh, when we were there, the, the crop was already finished for the season, but you've got six metre tall hemp that grows wild in, in stands as dense as a commercial fibre crop. And these are wild, undeveloped varieties. Um, uh, land race from China. This is three month old plant growing in a 10 litre pot, um, and it's already three, four metres tall. Um, so again, the potential for development and the need for uh, investment in development of new varieties, if you compare that sort of growth with some of the, the European varieties, um, the, the biomass yields and the yields you get off them are, are so far above um, trying to bring European varieties across. It's worth putting the investment into this type of work. Um, and in the context of the longer industry, not just for now. Um, so gaps in research, um, replicated comparative variety trials, very, very important. A lot of people make a lot of claims about what their varieties can do, um, but 
then not replicated variety comparison trials to, to actually weed out what's real. All of the varieties need to be grown in the same locations under the same conditions so they can be statistically analysed um, to find out what real, what, what's actually real, which varieties really do perform better and in multiple seasons, multiple soil types, multiple latitudes, uh, there's a lot of work needs to be done in the context of, of research and development of new varieties. Um, identification of varieties suited to the differing end uses, um, identification of varieties suited to different latitudes, um, understanding the effects of latitude and environment on things like planting and harvest states, growth and yield potential of different <laughs> varieties. Um, also very important and the research is in its infancy. A lot of research has been done with your European varieties, um, but they're just fundamentally not suitable for latitudes below 45 degrees. Um, they'll grow, but yield potential is significantly lower. So there's a lot more work needs to be done and places like UK um, are well situated to be able to do that sort of research. Um, as well as us in Australia, collaborations between Australian research and American research allows us to have the opportunity for two seasons in a single year instead of only a single grow season. Um, we overlap, share our data. Um, it's, we'll speed up the process of working out uh, which varieties are suited to what and where. Um, and we're also using quite advanced breeding techniques uh, to try and reproduce the yields gained, yield gains achieved in other major crops in the Green Revolution. Since the 1960s, maize yields have doubled, um, largely because of uh, genetic research, DNA markers, that sort of thing. So we've developed DNA markers uh, that we can use in hemp for these different traits. <clears throat> um, just to give you an idea how Australia sits relative to the US, we are actually upside down relative to you, uh, but our, lati our latitudes e extend basically for the majority of America and much further south and we do trialling from essentially here Brisbane and all the way down to Hobart. So the information we're gathering is extremely relevant to this belt in America um, in the context of varietal selection and varietal development. Uh, platform resources we're using is the Global Genetic Resource Collection, trait characterization uh, that comes out, the use of molecular markers, um, an integrated data storage system, um, which there's a huge amount of power in this and collaborating with other universities and other places, um, we can feed all of that information into a database, uh, which speeds up the process of, of identifying what will perform where, um, and genome and data mining. Uh, <clears throat> The main approaches we're taking is to harness that genetic variation uh, to develop advanced fibre properties, um, chemotype analysis, uh, which is for your medicinal compounds, um, nutritional seed composition, uh, pre-breeding research and development, trait to genome, um, agronomic assessment, latitude adaptation, uh, which ultimately ends up in the development of new cultivars. Um, and then pilot scale extraction uh, and purity with your medicinal compounds um, with a TGA accredited lab, which is quality assurance and quality control, which is going to be paramount for the medicinal industry. And it allows you to end up with reproducible results. Um, <coughs> harnessing the genetic variation uh, allows us to end up with accelerated plant breeding. Um, we can reduce the time for creating new varieties. Our facility allows us to do uh, four generations a year. If you're talking about conventional breeding programs with conventional crops, um, you're getting one to two generations a year if you're lucky. Um, we have the opportunity 
by being able to do four generations a year to speed up that breeding program significantly. Um, the difficulty then becomes bulking up of new varieties. That process, because it has to be done outdoors, uh, will still take to get from a, a research quantity of seed um, up to commercial levels will still take three to four years. Um, there's not a lot of option there in, in terms of that. Um, so the <clears throat> we accumulate our pre-breeding portfolio, which is all the information I've just discussed. Um, this then allows us to do predictive breeding by crossing varieties with specific traits. We can incorporate single or multiple traits from one variety into another um, for the end use requirements, be it medicinal, be it fibre herd properties, be it chemical composition. Um, this process that we're using uh, allows us to do it very in very targeted ways. So an overview of the <coughs> plant science program, uh, germplasm collection and storage, germplasm repropagation, which is extremely important and expensive. Um, but if we don't keep all the varieties alive, we won't have that variation available for future plant breeding um, in the coming decades. Uh, Characterisation and analysis, uh, trialling at multiple latitudes, um, publishing the results so that other research entities uh, can also benefit from our experience, um, breeding for specific end uses, uh, and then there's agronomic optimization is, is working out how best to grow those varieties, fertilizer requirements, etc. etc. Uh, we have an extensive team uh, at SCU. Um, working on this. Um, thank you for your attention. Any questions? Um, well, the old Kentucky varieties essentially don't exist anymore. Um, but the germplasm that was used to create those varieties, yes. Um, we have them um, and we are developing varieties with a similar genetic background to the old Kentucky hemp. Um, originally, the Kentucky hemp were Chinese and Japanese land races, um, and they were combined with some European genetics in, essentially in order to shorten the flowering period and increase seed yields. So yes, we are, and we can and we are. Um, they're going to the biggest issue they're going to have um, is sourcing germplasm uh, to, to work with. Um, it's more likely that uh, companies like ours will develop varieties and once we've got them into a, a, a uniform, stable fashion, um, that they will potentially then be passed on to, to seed companies um, to, to do the serious bulking up of seed. Yep. Um, the male plant obviously is very, very similar to the female plant. Um, and it's especially in, in the context of breeding for THC content for industrial hemp, keeping it low, the male plant doesn't express the same levels of cannabinoid production that the females do. Um, but in that context, we can still select specific <coughs> males um, for breeding purposes. Uh, generally speaking, yes. Um, I wouldn't necessarily agree that the, they're becoming more and more hermaphroditic or monoecious varieties. The European industry um, developed a substantial number of monoecious varieties. Um, they actually spend quite a lot of time and effort and money keeping them monoecious. Um, it eliminates the separate male and female plants, but there are some limitations that that opposes, that that, that creates um, in the context of, of yield and harvest and um, overall potential. So we're not working uh, particularly with monoecious varieties. How, um, how do you 
are you all propagating your plants? Are you strictly from seed? Are you ruby cuttings, tissue culture? Um, pre program? Predominantly seed. Um, but when we identify particular individuals that have a particular characteristic that we're after, uh, we'll clone them um, in order to get a more uniform base population for seed production. Obviously, if you generate seed from a clone population, genetically they'll be more closely related than if you've got multiple females that, that have genetic variation within them. So predominantly seed, um, but in specific cases we do clone material in order to get seed quantities up um, with genetically more stable material. I'm today going to just touch on how we go about processing. So these are the sorts of crops that we're dealing with in Australia. Um, between four, five metres, plant density of anywhere from 80 to 120 plants per square metre. Roughly aiming for sort of thumb thickness in diameter. Um, there's some countries in the world that still harvest this stuff manually, if you can believe that. So our system aimed to mechanise the whole process from start to finish without actually having to do anything by hand essentially. Our harvest process now allows one person to do the, the total harvest from start to finish essentially. So we developed this system over, I suppose, 18 years, come, sort of come to fruition over the last few years and we've pretty well tried every available bit of machinery that you can use to harvest this stuff to come up with our system. So this is, well the first step of the process is to mow it and we use a, a camper front. We've tried to use machinery that you can essentially buy off the shelf in some aspects and then you can modify it to suit your needs. Um, the jag that drives it, it's essentially just a prime mover. It just drives it, this thing cuts it. The only item that you can't buy is this chopper box in here it's developed by a company in Europe, it's specifically for hemp. That's what cuts the hemp into six, 600 mil billets or two foot billets when you do the mowing. And that machine can mow anywhere up to eight acres an hour, depending on the density and the size of the crop. So once it's mowed, it spits it into these windrows here. And those windrows are probably, in some instances, three foot wide by two and a half foot high and they're just wet green material. So once it's mown, the, the reading process will start and we do what's commonly referred to as dew reading. We just leave it in the field to ret. And depending on weather conditions, temperature, rainfall, wind, it can all have an impact on the time it takes for that product to dry down. So but anywhere up to four weeks is, is sort of standard. Usually after a week, week and a half, the top of the windrow will start to brown off and dry, dry down and that's when we go into step two which is turning the windrow. So we use what's known as an inverter rate and just to give you an idea this is commonly used in Australia for silage or hay. We've rebuilt this thing four times already due to the abrasiveness of the hemp and it's just not designed or engineered to handle the volume and the density of material that goes through it. So. A lot of the stuff we work on, we tend to rebuild at least once to get the desired result that we need. So those that are looking to get into the fibre market, it's not as simple as going in and saying, oh, I'll have that rake and that mower and away you go. There's a, there's a fair bit more involved, uh, which hopefully Ecofibre can help along the way to find out some of those issues. So once the, the wind roads are dried down, we go into it with a standard um, forage harvester that you use for corn, silage, maize, a whole variety of things. We use a pick up front. The, the cutting blades and the spout is set up slightly different to the layer for the hemp, but you know, essentially it's a machine you can buy off the shelf that you can modify. And anyone can modify it once you know what you're doing. So when it's just blown into chaser bin, follow buggy, flugel trailer, what, whatever you guys use over here. This process is module construction, similar to exactly the same system they use in cotton. So, you know, those modules will pack in, you get anywhere from 8 to 12 tonne, depending on the moisture content of the hemp at the time of harvest. Depending how well you tarp it, that'll store comfortably for two years prior to having to process it.
And that's and they just this is a, a module truck just comes, picks it up in the field and delivers it straight to the mill ready to go. The second way we do it is uh, bun construction. Same deal, we've just got a walking floor truck in this instance. Exactly the same systems picked up out of the paddock, blown into the truck, goes back there, it's rolled into essentially the same as a silage pit that you guys might do over here. And then it's just covered and, and left outside. And we've just uncovered one of these and processed it at home, and it's been in that form for nearly four years, and it's some of the best material we've processed. So it can store for a long period of time. And depending on the location of mill to farm, um, it's easy just to leave these on the farmer's farm, paying the storage fee, and then you just go and take the module apart or the bund apart as you need it at the mill. And then recently we have done it in bales. So just um, eight foot square bales, essentially. It's not a process we recommend, but um, we have done it and we more did it for the benefit of trying it to see if we could do it and to see if our mill could handle it, which you know, the mill had no trouble pulling apart that material when it was in there. But the reading process, some people that get into it will get a little bit excited and think that the product's ready and they'll take it off. But the back end of that is when it gets to your mill, you use three times as much energy to process it. So the reading process is critical to how well your mill performs and that has implications on the cost of running the mill and the product and, and that flows down the line. So. That is basically our harvesting process. We've simplified it down. The most cost effective way to harvest is building these buns. For us, in our experience, I mean, there's people in Australia are doing bales, there's people in Australia are doing modules. But we've done every process and we collect all the data, we analyze all the costs, we keep graphs, we keep labor, we keep diesel, we keep everything. And that is the most cost effective way of doing it. If someone else can find a more cost effective way of doing it, we'd be happy to hear about it. And that's just our experience though. Here you might have another way and you might find it cheaper. So let's going to move on to our mill now. Um, as Phil touched on before, we more developed the mill out of necessity. There's no processing infrastructure in Australia prior to us starting. Now this is the only processing infrastructure in Australia. So as Phil touched on, the importance of getting from your seed supply to your material science how do you get to that point if you can't produce any material for, for them to trial? So over the last five years, we've sort of finalised this design. And again, we, we run a full operational matrix of this that, that covers or analyses every cost that goes into production. And prior to, I mean, where's the laser on this thing? So this is our feed bin. This is where the raw material is fed into. It's pulled apart in here goes in here into a flail hammer which does the decorticating but we also our harvesting system does the first lot of decortication in the field. The blade configuration in that 880 actually starts a decortication process there. So we've already done probably 30-40% of the decorticating in the field which means less money and time spent in the mill. Then the material goes through this, there's a flail header in here that does the last part of the decorticating. There's a trommel in here which separates the fibre from the herd. And then that herd comes out the back here and goes onto a grading screen. Those screens in that table there have been developed with importing product from other areas, going out to the marketplace and asking them what sort of material they preferred. And then we work backwards from there. We then design the screens, our throughput, even the bags that we put our product in to meet the market demand in our area. And it's something that you're going to have to do here as well. I know you've got a horse industry. Our largest selling product is our horse bedding. We can't process enough horse bedding. And it took a long time for that to happen. But once people start using it, they realise the benefits of it, they start using more and more of it and it just flows on from there. But that was probably a two year process to get exactly the right size material they wanted delivered in the right size bag at a price point they were happy with paying. And that comes back to the matrix, the operational matrix that we run with the mill, which gives us all the data we can. So we know where we can cut corners or where we can cut costs to try and get A, the price point down or a price point that we're happy with going to the marketplace in because essentially we still got to make money. But we didn't get in it to, to process product. We got in it to develop the technology for other people to process product. I mean, this isn't our core business. 
we've done this out of necessity. Same as the harvesting, we've done that out of necessity. So like Ecofibre is about developing the IP and making that IP available to other people. Like it's not what we want to do. Like I don't want to be working in the mill all day every day and going down, although it's nice sitting in an air-conditioned machine with a radio for a week or two, but it soon gets boring. So, you know, we've done it out of necessity to essentially build a market in Australia, build a demand for the product, and, and build a demand what Ecofibre can offer the public. So it has cost a lot of time, a lot of energy. Yeah, we make a little bit of money off this, probably covers the cost for the mill, but we, you know, we've still got a research farm to run, we've still got new varieties to grow out, like we've got a whole other range of things we can be doing other than operating a mill. So um, let's go a bit further. So yeah, we've spent several years developing this mill, extensive R and D's gone into this money. Service the needs of all, I mean, the mill's about servicing the needs of all organisations looking to value add to their business through the process and grading of industrial hemp in quality saleable products. And that's what we're about, is developing the IT to allow people like you guys that are here today that want to get in us help to go into the marketplace with the confidence that you've got the equipment and the IP available to do that. So that the system we've designed, throughput of two and a half, three and a half tonne of raw material per hour. Now our system, and I'm not trying to sell our system, you can put our system in for a million dollars or under a million dollars. A two tonne system out of Europe costs two and a half million euro and that's not even installed or any electrical costs. So it gives you a cost, and that doesn't include infrastructure or sheds. So you know, to buy a machine out of Europe, it's a five million euro job just to get up and running. Low energy costs, ours is a two man operation, well it's actually a one and a half man operation because you've got one bloke in a machine and another bloke operating the mill, so, you know, low maintenance, less than an hour a week if you do your maintenance on the mill. Um, quick to profit, you know, less than three years you can break even, depending on the areas you grow, products you sell, the markets you target and the costs you're getting. And it can, you know, accept variable forms of feedstock, you can take bales, modules, buns, so not everyone's going to be set up to make modules or buns, but a lot of people are set up to do bales, and it can accept bales. It's an entry, it's an entry level mill design. It can be added to, as your business grows, the mill can grow. It's all about scaling it up. So, you know, if you're up and you need to produce an extra 20, 30, 40 tonne a week, we can add another module, uh, another trommel, or we can add another file hammer, or another feed bin. So, and it produces seven or eight products straight off the bat. So hemp bedding, the horse, horse bedding, hemp creek herd for building, hydromulch, seeding, oil spill mop containment, paper pulp grade fibre, organic soil conditioner, garden mulch, I've actually got organic soil conditioner there twice. And these are just some photos, the hydromulch, the bedding, um, hemp creek construction. I'm not sure what that's like here, but it's, it's really gained some momentum in Australia over the last couple of years, and, and mainly because the product is available there now. A lot of people are getting on board with it. Oil spill containment via remediation. The hemp actually outperforms every oil spill containment product in the market in Australia considerably. It uses a third of the less material to absorb the same amount of oil. And there's, I could get into bio remediation, and, but I've only got 20 minutes. <laughs> um, garden mulch, actually, garden mulch was put on the gardens in federal parliament before it was even approved and they realised what it was and they uh, subsequently got it taken out of the gardens that were there. So. And these are just some of the mill components. We've, um, we're in the process now of having all our components reverse engineered. So we've got full manufacturing spec drawings for the, the items in there that we've developed ready to go. And we can get them manufactured anywhere. That, that's our feed bin, that's our trommel screen, that's, these are just the 3D drawings. That's our shaker screen, it's essentially you guys that have shaker screens here. We've just got the, the way the machine shapes and the, the gaps in between the screens and the screen sizes are just something that we've developed over the last few years. And that's me, I've probably gone through that a bit quick, but I'm happy to take any questions if you've got any. So ours are spread out, we've got this in one shed to separate, this is a fairly dusty process. <coughs> Of course, ours is, a, ours is a mobile processing facility. Our trommel screen's mounted on a semi-trailer. 
So we could essentially move this from farm to farm if we needed to. It's just something that we, and by, by having it as a mobile system, we don't have to have any dust extraction where we are. But if you put it in an enclosed environment, you would. But, you know, the, the footprint for that, that's just a 40 foot container, essentially, the size of a 40 foot container. That's only uh, one and a half metres wide by 10 metres long. And you can accept, you could stack that hard up against that, or you could stack that next to that and just change your, conf your conveyor configuration. So you can get it in quite a compressed area. It just depends on your access and egress for loading and unloading and, and then where you take the material. We move all the material, raw material by air. So to take out, we used to, when we first started, we'd actually have to load it in the bulk bags and then move a bulk bag and then load another bulk bag and move another bulk bag and that was another two people. So then we, we moved the air straight over to a storage shed. We don't touch it now, we put it in this end there. It goes out the other end, the only time it gets touched is when it goes away for packaging. So, yeah. Yep. Do you have to worry about mold at all if it's sitting under that tarp for No, years? providing you keep the moisture out. Even some moisture may wick in naturally for moisture in the ground, but we haven't had any issues. But you do need to seal it, like a silage bund or something similar. Yeah. Yep. Is there any waste in the waste? There is, but the waste is saleable product. So we capture the waste the fines and then that goes into oil absorbency, um, organic soil conditioner, there's a whole range of products you can sell that into. So the only other waste is dust but we and we don't capture that dust. Yeah? You mentioned building a demand and obviously you guys in Australia are several years ahead of us. Um, at what point in the commercial, either do you have commercial to scale, do you have growers that are growing, you know, tens or hundreds of acres? Yeah, we do usually contract growers. We've, we've grown, we've contracted over 200 acres a year ago. Hectares. Hectares, sorry, a year ago. So we, we have a, a group of contract growers, but if your grower is more than 50, well, in Australia, more than 50 kilometres from the mill, it's not viable to ship that material that far. So, uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Thanks for your time, everyone. So what are we really talking about? This is the revolution we're about to take place with, and, and it's a thing called chemergy. And it's the genetic capacity for a plant to create the elements that industry needs, and you design, you design your plant to fit the industry, or what someone is looking after. So it's, it's not a new concept, it's a really old concept. And, and one of the first chemergic sort of people were Henry Ford and, and Rudolf Diesel. They were using agricultural products to do that. And ultimately, you know, we're not going to run out of oil tomorrow, but the price is not going to get cheaper. And therefore, there will be a convergence of, of, of production and capability, and then what we produce in, from, from agriculture will become uh, viable where it isn't presently today in some cases. Um, the whole point of this was in, in the very beginning, and I'm sort of going backwards, but why did I get into this? Uh, was that there was a pretty obvious thing going on. Global population increase was not even taken into consideration. What it was about is the disposable income. Disposable income in, say, China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, something like that. You just give them, those people, another 50% you know, salary over a period of, say, 10 years to spend, and your, your consumption of things globally doubles. And if you think about that, that means twice the amount of timber, twice the amount of oil, twice the amount of cotton, twice the amount, it's just not going to happen. You can't just double all the traditional, present traditional use of, of resource materials that we use to make things out of uh, in that period. We just can't do it. So that gave rise to the opportunity for something that was, uh, uh, and I didn't have hemp to start with. I had a mission, and my mission found hemp as the answer. So sort of coming from a slightly different angle to some. So I found hemp to have all the unique attributes to be able to be able to grow in at every, you know, from the, 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 the Arctic Circle to the, 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 the other one. Um, <laughs> um, you know, at all latitudes. And so unlike cotton, you, 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 you're stuck with certain latitudes. Um, most crops are stuck that way. But hemp, you can grow basically everywhere if you've got the right variety suited to those conditions. Therefore, the machinery that you develop and the systems and the products that you develop can be grown regionally everywhere. 
And you're not dependent on some place for oil or some place for bananas or some place for avocados or whatever else that you can't get, wool or whatever. So it, 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 it loosens up the, uh, uh, the monopolistic strings that certain countries have to supply certain products and, you know, makes business everywhere. Um, so that was the reason, and that, that's just a quick graph on world demand predicted, and, and this yellow line is the other, which hemp is part of, and what the demand could be in the future. So good, good, good reason to get into business, I was looking at that end here, but I think uh, in 2050 I'll be that cognizant of it, but um, yeah, it's, it's there to be had, and that's why I'm pleased to see old folks like me, but young fellows in here as well, because you guys are going to be the ones who are going to inherit the industry that us old fogies put together. What is it used in? We all know about cars. There's one. Um, lots of different applications, polycomposite uh, uh, materials. Uh, here's a nice little project. Uh, it hasn't actually worked out quite so well. One-way pallets that are biodegradable. You put them outside after they've arrived at the other end. Rainwater, whatever. You've got garden mulch afterwards. Um, uh, Chinese army, they're big into it too, they love it. Um, these are uh, uh, ballistic proof tents, they, they're using this um, uh, silicon carbide uh, material that they produce out of their helmets, it's all organic derived filters for gases and things like that. Um, and so what you do is you get down into the nitty gritty of what this is all about and we've done some extensive research in the material science end to find out what are the actual attributes of this this plant and what are they made up of. For example, you can say roughly 50% carbon. That's a fair carbon intake and you had that question before. Well, it's an annual plant so it's not counted in the carbon credit system. It has to be perennials. Well, that's only a matter of influence and money. Can you change politics? I can change anything. <laughs> give, me, give me a minute or two and I'll, I'll get it done. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, those things are hard to move got to, because there is entrenched things going on in the political world. Um, but many other things. It, it just goes on and on and on. But very few people have really looked into the material end of things to analyse what's actually in there. You know, this, this, uh, these pores in here, we can actually extract those. And if you actually turn them into carbon, you make wonderful uh, uh, air and water and gas filters. Different varieties produce different cellulose, uh, cellulose co uh, uh, pockets and they uh, will encapsulate certain gases different to others. So instead of having to go to the synthetic way to make these things, you can actually just grow it, treat it, certain varieties, certain conditions and away you go. Just think of uh, hemp a little bit like wine in a way, you know, there's, you know, you've got your champagne, you've got your reds, you've got your white, they're grown on the hillside this way, it's a certain type of grape. That's what you do. It's not just one size fits all with hemp. And, and when you get more specific about it, you reach more specialised, more high value markets. Um, so why Kentucky? Um, why now and why the USA? All right, well, I truly believe this. I mean, I won't go into why Australia, it's never gonna happen in Australia. Uh, we'll probably never be very good at ice hockey as well. But, um, but what's important is, is that we just don't have the population we tie too diversely. We don't even have a car industry. We manufacture nothing. We should be wearing turbans because all we do is actually sell our, our, our oil and our, our minerals and that's about it. You know, that's all we've got in beaches and things and a bit of tourism, good wine, a bit of music. But, uh, but essentially we have converted from being an agricultural nation into, into a mining nation and there is only one or two areas of support. One of those has been in the R&D area. We get a, a really terrific R&D opportunity, um, but we can't exercise anything within the country that we develop, and it's never been our intention to do so. From the very beginning, I mean, I'll give you an example. We have no textile industry of any nature. We have no car industry of any nature. We have no value-adding industries of any nature. And if we want to send something from our factory to, to say from just out of Sydney to Melbourne, it'll probably cost us, a, a, a truck would cost us two or three thousand dollars to just get product down there. Cost of fuel, cost, everything's just crazy. So it's not gonna happen as far as we're concerned. Where we consciously went for was when the USA comes online, 
this is where these technologies will be able to be applied commercially and effectively. We're just beginning. There's going to be other people that come in and do a lot better than us. That's fine. We don't care. Let's, let's get going. So if, it, if it's going to happen anywhere, it's going to happen in Kentucky because Kentucky's got the right sort of laws. It has not confused it with the marijuana law, which is terrific as well. I think you'll all agree. I mean, it's ridiculous. In, 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 in Colorado, you can sell as much dope as you like, uh, as long as you've got a license or whatever, but you can't actually sell one bit of your industrial heat prop. <laughs> what? I don't understand. Anyway, so Kentucky's great, legislatively. Tidy up a few things for great. But the big thing is, back to my, my thing, is this is the, the, the great place to grow it, and that's, that's a good start. And then you've got the industry and manufacturing within reasonable distance. You can engage those people in what you're doing. There's good innovation in research, innovative people here. I mean, you, 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 you Americans, you Yanks, you're good at this innovation thing. You came up with the space shuttle or something. You know, you've done some interesting things. And, and, and then you've got great markets here. And, and people are willing to try and consume new things and sort of be the first into place. So this is a fertile area for, 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 for market. And you've got investment capabilities. People are prepared to risk to profit. And you've got this uh, uh, legal, this history, and you also have the legal right to demand that you can grow this crop. That's what's really important. And I love the fact that you've got both the Democrats and, and the Republicans actually thinking sort of mutually about this subject, which is sort of quite weird. We never have that in Australia. Um, so, but the issues are there, and uh, you need to be aware of them. Uh, uh, you know, Europe is out there funneling along, and it's doing quite a good job. Loves the car industry, lots of stuff about happening about plastic and that sort of stuff. So there's some good technologies being developed there. But they're very focused on fibre and becoming a little bit more interested in CBD and, and, and food, but they're very focused on the outer fibre. They're not interested in the herd at all, which is a mistake. China has a capacity to grow right now. I mean, the mandate from the, um, uh, the uh, Premier of China and, and uh, the, uh, um, uh, what do they call the army there, the People's Liberation Army, PLA, um, was that the government said, look, we need to be secure within our borders of everything we need. We want to develop a crop. I went, when I was invited in there, and I went up a four-storey building and had the hallway about this size here, except for it had all these different crops down both sides. And then when I walked down, they said, oh, we tried this and we tried that and we tried this and we tried that. And we got to the end, they said, and we ended up with hemp because it had all the properties that we were looking for. Hey, that's why I got involved. So that was terrific. And then you go into an even bigger room and they've got all these materials that they've worked on around. So the Chinese are out there and doing it, but their primary objective is to feed their people and at this point in time, they still need to grow carrots and whatever else that they eat and rice and things like that. So hemp is sort of relegated to the, the, the terraces and the back blocks. Um, so there's an opportunity. But China is something to watch out for because they'll be in like Flynn with CBD here as well. I can tell you that. And I um, suppose you know what in like Flynn means. Good. That was Errol Flynn, by the way. Um, Australian. Um, uh, and India. India is, is, is coming on on flat out too. There's no two ways about that. They'll be in there as well. So to do it here and to be ahead of the game, you've got to think innovation and you've got to think, you know, scale and you've got to think markets and you've got to think all those sort of things and cut out the labour element being the, the issue. And that is easily done because one thing I have noticed is that when you go to China or India, you look at an area, a, a field, and the guys that are harvesting over that end there are doing it to the guy, different to the guys who are doing it over here, there. So they have a lot of inconsistency in their product. Whereas if you have a machine that goes through and treats the fight and you get the good varieties in there, they're all the same, the machine goes through the same, it's very uniform and that's what manufacturers like. Uniformity. Scale, demand and price is the next thing. The scale is, 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 is what it's about. You need to upscale, and some people will be disappointed to know that I believe that, that, that CBD will drop, you know, in the next three years, CBD will not be a crop that you will want to be relying on for your income, because scale will be what it will be about. And also consider this, that these wonderful products like CBD should be available to all the people who need it for their cancers or their whatever it is. We can't keep it at a price 
right up here, uh, you know, thirty thousand dollars for dosages for children uh, for the uh, this is wrong. So you know, the scale will change that. Um, time to achieve the scale is the issue, and collaboratively you'll get there faster than individually. Um, so you need to interface that that value chain that I put in before. You know, look at all other industries; they all do segment themselves eventually and settle into that thing. You know, people doing R and D for plant breeding, people doing handling and mowing and whatever else, people doing processing, people doing something else. You know, you, to try and do the whole thing, which we've had to do, uh, is crazy. You're vertically integrated to an extent, but don't try and do the whole value chain. Settle on what you do best and join with those that, in, in, in a vertical way. These are my suggestions. Um, product standards. You know, without standards, you're never going to be able to have contracts. You need contracts for forward contracts. You've got to be able to write stuff. There are no standards for fibre at this point in time anywhere in the world. We've got them for, for flax and wool and, and, and cotton and others. You can go and you know, get a bankable contract that you can do. We need those things to happen. So standards need to be created. Um, a product competition you've got to be aware of. You know, hemp is, uh, you know, people just don't want to buy hemp because it's hemp, really, in the manufacturing industry. You know, uh, some people can afford to buy a hemp car, but not many, because it's too expensive. So price is important and the competition from other raw material substances have got to be considered in all this. So really, it's the other things that you should be seeing as competitors, not necessarily within the group. So we'll look outside a little bit because they're just as important or interested in making sure uh, you don't succeed. Um, and, and, and development of new manufacturing systems and, and, and um, uh, you know, having common or, or, or getting together with common research goals and finding those people who are interested in the same thing as you. I mean, here for example, we're doing a project with a mustard seed uh, company, um, which is, uh, we're also, we're doing an antibacterial food product as well, but, but what we've come up with is a meat tray uh, with the absorbent pad in it. So the meat tray is antibacterial, but the absorbent tray is, is, is or part of it is preservative. So we're able to uh, look at uh, increasing the shelf life of meat uh, in the supermarket by about three or four days. Um, so, I mean, we're collaboratively working with other people because it's not going to happen just by hemp alone, it's not going to happen by you alone. So look for collaboration. So these are my wisdom, words of advice, whatever you want to call it. Um, so to sum up with what Tim was doing, you know, it's about collecting the genetics, uh, characterising it, analysing it, completely so we know every little bit of it as best we can. Publishing that data, we don't mind, put it up there, everybody can get, you know, we, we're looking for that, and that, and that. Okay, put those together, go and plant breed it. Um, uh, plant breeding itself, and then uh, uh, growing condition uh, optimization. Um, from Adam's perspective, it's about the harvesting and handling, and, and superseding that. The, the, the thing with the uh, harvesting was, uh, not only because there wasn't one in Australia, because you know, how was I going to be able to even work out a price point for, for selling the product if I didn't know the costs to get to there? It's all very well to grow it, but what's the manufacturing costs and therefore what's the delivery price? Is it competitive in the market? Yes, of course I need to do that. But we have this catch-22 system. Which comes first? You get a whole lot of growers to grow the crop and then stockpile it until you've got enough and you can afford a $10 million mill? Or do you put in a $10 million mill and then start seeing if the growers want to grow it? I mean, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So we said we must find a way of making this an affordable processing system to kickstart the industry so a product can get out the door, can pay the farmers, can pay for itself for the mill, and turn it around in about two years and have everybody profitable and then expect Because that's when you can scale up. But you need to establish your markets. You need to establish your system. You've got to get out there and sell people the stuff. You know, one of the, uh, one, one of the, when I first started off, I had this one of the, they said you can't grow it in Australia. Well, so I grew it, you know. And they said, all right, well, you can grow it. So, so what? Well, can you process it? So I packed it all in containers and sent it off to France. We had a, a joint venture with the French company at the time. And uh, we sent it off there and they processed it. And, 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 and I brought it back. And, 
And uh, I said, well, here it is, it's been processed. So there are machines that can process a crop we can grow. Look at that. And they said, yeah, but can you sell it? So I went out there and I sold it and I told them to do all that sort of stuff. And then I went to them and I said, look, we can sell it. People will buy it at this price. And they said, great, well, that's terrific. And that was the end of the government's involvement in it. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, um, there's other evaluating systems. Uh, this one down here is an interesting one, you can hardly see it, but I'll, I'll tell you what, this is part of the dream. Um, there's a micronization process, and um, that micronization process takes the, the, the hemp stalk in its whole down to you know, microns. And we took the juices that it produced and the pulp that it produced, and we combined them again after we had put the stalks through it. And we were able to make things that were so solid in a new form. So what we're doing is taking the organic material and all its juices and the lignin and all the glues and whatever, and we're putting it through a process and then we're reshaping it. So we're just reshaping the material as effectively. And we had uh, marbles as hard as wood just converted like through that process. So in a way, what we might be able to do in the longer term is look at decentralising industry by having a sort of vision of maybe we can outside your house or on your farm or near your village or your town or within a state have a capacity to take this material, put it through some sort of micronising system, put it into a 3D printer, download what you need and I can tell you from Australia, we need tractor parts like you don't believe, and they're always in Germany or somewhere else when we want them, and we have to wait weeks. It'd be nice, then we could print our gearbox thing and put it in our tractor and keep going. If we can do that, if we can realise the capacity for a, a, a raw material to be able to be printed, and there's a lot of other concepts that are out there about this in a 3D type situation, we actually create industry locally with local materials. We're not having to sort of derive these things from other places. And that's a far-fetched concept, but I hope we get there one day. I think it would be great on decentralisation and bringing people back to connecting with the earth. So uh, my last, the second last slide, because, oh, oh yes, I've got this one here. Cannabinoids. Boy, um, it's, it's a big, uh, big, big industry, believe it or not. Uh, well, I know you believe it. But I think it's, there's a lot of people going to get hurt. And I just, uh, I, I want people to be cautious about this. Um, it, 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 it's, it's liable to, you know, have a big bubble. Uh, you could waste a lot of money and time getting set up for it, and then the price could just go, Phew. so be careful. Um, another reason. You know, the FDA, like the, the TGA and the Therapeutic Goods in Australia, the FDA in the USA, um, they're, they're, this, this need, you need to be careful about this also happening and how it's managed and whether it gets relegated into the pharmaceutical industry at some stage or, or remains nutraceutical or whatever. There, there needs to be some uh, consideration there. I don't know what the answer is. And that's it for me. And have a good lunch. Oh, questions. Thank you.